Well, I mean, um, Akim has been around the national team since he was 15 years, eh, you know, and um, he played at two junior World Cups, under 17 and under 20. I can safely say before the under 20 World Cup, he had cardiac evaluation and so, blood tests and so, which were normal. The problem with these things, um, cardiac maturity could happen 20, 21 years, and he was about 17, 18 years at that time. I mean, maybe things change. I, I, I'm not privy to his um, medical records or so, but um, it may be that he might be totally normal and probably something he took might have caused the problem. You know, there are, there are many drugs out there that could affect the heart. In addition to that, we are in talks now with the Federation, the Trinidad and Tobago Football Federation, to bring about a policy for screening. Now, we want to do this on a phase basis. As you could realize, screening athletes for cardiac disease could be very costly. Now, we have the FIFA prototype, which could cost about three, four thousand dollars per player. Now, if every player goes to who play football, I mean, millions of people play football in the world. Tens of thousands of people play football in Trinidad, so that might not be feasible to adopt. So what we're trying to do right now is probably use the Canadian model, where we do a basic screen on all players, and only those who seem to have like some abnormality that is beyond what a normal sportsman would have, then we, we investigate them further. And we, we estimate that this could cost somewhere, the average screening could be somewhere about 500 initially for history, physical exam, ECG, that sort of thing. And if it is that they need to do further testing, then we estimate that to be around 15 to 20% of players may have some abnormality, a murmur or something, which may turn out to be you know, insignificant. Then we subject them to other tests. But I mean, the harsh reality is that many players have tests and evaluations and so on, they come back normal and they still go and get sudden cardiac, they, they die, they get heart attacks, you know. What we do for those cases, I mean, is impossible. So what we hope to do is reduce the incidence. We want to look at it from the Football Federation as a, as a pilot project starting with the professional league. So maybe in the few, next few months, professional leagues, will, before their players come to the national teams, they, um, they, they, they come with their medicals or so. But it's amazing that some of the big teams in Europe and so do do a great physical examination or investigate their, many of the players. You know, we could think back at Mark Vivian Foy, 2003, died suddenly. He would play at some big clubs and never had any medical examinations on him or so. So we try to do this on a phase basis and we will look at it hopefully from the professional league and then we want to look at it from the, probably extend it into the secondary school football league. You know, but at the end of the day, the cost would be the limiting factor, and I think that we just have a look at it from that point of view. Just, just to add a two cents to that, um, one of the things that we are trying to do at Sport, at Sport TT, is that we be, once you play a sport, you're 2.3 more likely to have a cardiac event. So sudden cardiac death is any death happening within 24 hours of playing. The heart is like any other muscle. You train a muscle, it gets bigger. The heart, so too, gets bigger. The most common cause of heart congenital or, or sudden death in our population will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the heart enlarges asymmetrically. But detecting that may not be at a first visit. It may not be at a second visit. But if we have policies that ensure that our athletes are tested and screened annually or biannually, then we will pick up the rate they change. The point is, the question that, that we will, and we pu you know, push this question to all our administrators, is that are they going to, are they strong enough to put a value to life. And I'm certainly not. I think every life saved by a, by a proper screening program will solve that problem. It's worth that investment. The world spends hundreds of thousands of dollars on all sorts of things, but the health of our athlete is still paramount. And at Sport Company, with Tobias and our team, it is something that we're evolving. It is very, very expensive, and it's very difficult. And our incidence rates for, for predicting an adverse effect is less than 10%. So we may spend $200 million and pick up 10 adverse effects. But in my, my perception and my value of the athlete, that 10% salvage ability to life is worth it. So it's up to everybody else to include that banter. Yeah, jump on that one. <laughs> so we have another question coming on. Pleasant good afternoon. I'm Lincoln Charles, a member of the Defense Force. Um, I have two questions and one comment. Uh, my first question is, um, I, I did the test on myself, uh, whereas um, how do we treat, is it feasible for you to, uh, if you're in competition, and you have a competition today, a competition tomorrow, and um, most of the time we say, as we come out of the competition phase, we head into the ice, ice bath, right? So uh, we want to reduce blood pool and all this stuff. Um, how feasible is, is that, as opposed to ice, 
we keep them in the hut. And because they have a competition tomorrow, we want to send them in a hot bath, let them be, so that we want to keep the blood, so that they can get better performance. That's one of my questions. Um, also, the, a comment, um, we are talking about injuries and how injuries occur. And um, I think a lot of the injuries occur because we train in the strategic movement most of the time, and we do opposed to transverse and differential. So I think that um, at your strategic level, um, you know, imposing that you know coaches understand those different planes and movement and how we train those movements because that's how we prevent injury. I think that um, that would be really useful to coaches. And um, the last one, we always um, talk about assessment for athletes. We do have no kind of rubric for coaches and assessment. So I don't know how we could go back and um, review that so that all coaches can have the same idea and the same ideology. Just, just to, on the question of, co of coaches, and I mean, I will de jump to defend the lead program at sport because I am one of those people involved with it. I mean, that is something that, that, that is being established. Uh, uh, but the challenge is that when we ask the NGBs to give us a list of their approved coaches, it's six months later, Tobias, and we still haven't gotten that list. But we are, just as we are developing athletes and, and medical, we are trying to develop coachings to set standards of education because the single most things that makes us all better is becoming better educated, which is why we all go to conferences, that's why we read journals, because education makes us better. Um, and we are doing that for coaches. It's, it's been about six months of, of development, and it will, it will evolve within this year. I have a strong team at Spoke Company trying to do that. Hopefully that will happen. I think you also had a, had a question on ice baths versus hot, a hot bath. I don't know if you guys want to. Okay, ice baths, we use a lot of ice baths in our recovery. So anything that's high energy, which is eccentric exercises, causes micro tears within the muscle. So we use the ice baths purely in training first to get adaptations. And what it does, it slows down the metabolic response and allows uh, a chance for, for healing to happen. We do use contrast baths, which is, which is one minute in the cold, one minute in the ice. It depends on the season, it depends on the athlete, it depends on what works for the athletes. So an ice bath for all is not, will not work for everybody else. Some people, they put them in an ice bath, they stiffen up and will never be able to run again. The key component of whatever you do is best to be done in practice. So people will not jump into an ice bath in a competition phase for the first time because you get a rise in heart rate, a rise in blood pressure, and everything else that you don't want to happen in a recovery phase. So try it in your practice. Okay. I can also give my um, experience. Footballers don't seem to like ice baths at all. <laughs> <laughs> You never get them, you buy all the ice, you do everything, you know, in the Greece and Gold Cup, there are tons of ice after the games, they wouldn't use it. And I mean, so, I mean, at the end of the day, it's an individual preference. Some like it, some don't. But um, when we look at analyses of studies done on ice baths, and so, the major, the major thing have been psychological. There are a lot in tissue biomarkers, and so, like creatine kinase, and so, which will come down after an ice bath. But ice baths has been associated with a, a greater incidence of delayed onset muscle soreness, what we refer to as DOMS. So as Anil said, you wouldn't want to do it in a, in a new competition. You know, sometimes you go on, everybody else doing this thing, and you just want your athletes to do it. The next day, you can really get some really muscular pains that they may not have had otherwise. But that has been one of the few drawbacks of ice baths. But again, it's an individual preference, and try to experiment with it before. Uh, just, just to address the coaching education, and the... Uh, the person was asking about whether or not we have training for coaches and rubrics for coaches and whatnot. And that is, that is where I work. I work in a department where that is what we do. We, we, we see the need, the country see the need for training and our coaches, and that is what we do. We train coaches, we, we teach people um, all the different, uh, the, the different skill set that they would need um, to be more effective coaches. Um, of course, we, if I could pay in a little plug, we coach, uh, we, we teach managers, we teach um, sport for development people, and, and we teach um, PE teachers as well. Uh, just, uh, just another bit, a uh, little bit of a comment as well, um, I, regarding the first question I had from the lady over there, and as well from this gentleman, uh, in terms of 
Coaching. Um, I think too, in, 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 to involve in that coaching education is an appreciation for the use of the research. Um, during our study, uh, I, it was a little bit disappointing. Um, we got really enthusiastic response from some coaches and uh, pretty much a, a, a shoulder from other coaches. And I, I was a little bit surprised uh, at that given the fact uh, that studies like these can really help the performance of athletes. So I think uh, encouraging the use of the evidence uh, and also not only coaches, but I think par parents, when we're talking youth development, um, uh, very important to educate the parents on uh, care for the athlete because the athlete is their child and they are caring for them as well. And parents need to be proactive in holding coaches and medical staff and all of us accountable um, for the good care of the athlete. Um, we have, room, so just, we have room for like two more questions. I, I think I had one up here. Yes, we have just one here and one here, right? We'll take, go ahead. Yeah, to answer that first question regarding uh, training our young ones too soon, that is real multidisciplinary, and there are many answers to that question, and I think, I'm sure our panelists will also have a response. Uh, from, I think what is huge is injury prevention from young, establishing those injury prevention programs. When you look at swimming, uh, the motion of, uh, is, is very repetitive in, all, in an overhead and almost a forward, forward posture, forward positions. And those, because of that uh, repetition, certain, and, and position, you use certain muscles more than others. Um, and if I were to draw an, uh, an example, the shoulder, the scapular muscles are not, people think, well, I'm swimming, I'm training my shoulder, but that's not, that's not so. You're only training certain muscles, and it's important to complement that with proper injury prevention programs that look at scapular stabilization, uh, glenohumeral stabilization, core stabilization, um, right through the kinetic chain down through the hips, um, not only for injury prevention, but also for uh, performance. Um, and another part of that is technique, the teaching of the correct technique. Swimming is a, a sport where they so, the, the level of competition is, is, is quite high in my opinion, um, and the parental pressure, as well as the coaching pressure, is super, super high. I mean, a lot of our swimmers now are getting skulls, scholarships to go abroad, and um, they are themselves, not only their parents, their coaches, but they themselves are pushing themselves. So I think it's, it's, it's very multidisciplinary. Um, parents need to get involved, coaches need to get involved, uh, strength and conditioning specialists need to get involved, injury prevention, physicians, etc., cetera, um, to help uh, taper that uh, high injury rate in our young athletes. And absolutely, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Creed here will, will tell testament to how we're trying to change summer camps and, and developing people away from training to compete at age seven and eight to training to, to play and, and trying to follow not anybody's long-term de athlete development, but our Trinidadian model of our own athlete development, and hopefully that will develop. Uh, absolutely, the sprinters only sprint on their forefoot, so they don't actually ever use uh, their, their hind foot in, in, in 400, 500, 800 meters, 100 meters. And I know Gregory does a lot of work when, in Gregory's one of the trainers who presented earlier about changing people's running mechanics to prevent injury. And he's done a lot in terms of getting people to now run on their forefoot running. And he's happy with his, 
his outcomes. And I'm sure people will disagree with him, but, uh, but it's certainly changing Trinidad a little bit. And yes, we'll be more than happy to do a research study on master swimmers, especially since age is a risk factor. <laughs> uh, we'll take our last question up here. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is King Noel from a student from the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Kingsley, you need to speak up a bit. They're not hearing you. Dr. Koki said, my question is directly, right? But everyone in the financial and access as well. Um, do you think that the way we train, well, you show a number of statistics um, according to the athletes when you were when you were speaking with them. But do you think 